Yeah, so just introduce myself. I'm Francis. Um, I graduated from NUS not long ago and I studied computer engineering. Yeah, so um, in NUS, we don't typically have like a AR, VR major, but there are some modules that are relevant. Yeah, so um, I'm currently working at in NUS as a AR, VR programmer. Yeah, so I think that I would know a thing or two about AR and VR. Yeah, so hope that y'all will learn something. Uh. This is the brief outline <laughs> of the workshop. I will say some stuff and hopefully you will learn some stuff. Um, there will be um, a little hands-on uh, demo later. Um, hopefully to get you to try for yourself how easy or how difficult it is to <laughs> come up with a simple AR, VR application. Yeah. yeah so the first question I wanted to ask right, um, is... I want to understand what's your background so I can understand what sort of uh, experience that you might want to create in the future. Um, anybody has any, any potential projects that they have in mind that they want to learn about and hope to learn how to create some, such an experience here? Yeah, I think uh, AI and VR is quite a buzzword nowadays. Like, you know, mixed reality, oh, with the HoloLens, or Oculus Quest. Yeah, so there's a lot of hype around it. Uh, but there's many ways to use it. So I, I wanted to find out if anybody has any uh, ideas so I can, like, you know, hopefully answer them and think about it along the way. I guess not. <laughs> okay. Uh, I guess you'll move on. Yeah, um, feel free to ask any questions along the way, okay? Yeah, I want to get some feedback from, from you guys and not feel like I'm <laughs> talking to a wall. And so it'll help me um, cater to your better. Lah. Okay, first, what is AR, VR, MR, XR, all these buzzwords? Yeah, so, yeah, they're really just buzzwords. Lah. But at a, at a high level, right, um, XR stands for extended reality, and it's like an umbrella term for all of these experiences. So um, what you might think of um, virtual reality, uh, mixed reality, or material reality would be from the, the media. For example, movies like um, Ready Player One, um, where they showcase uh, what it's like to be immersed in a virtual environment. And also um, movies like The Matrix have greatly influenced our perception of AR and VR, right? So um, yeah, it's a growing industry. Yeah, I, I think in recent years, uh, there are many AI and VR jobs um, being created, especially um, in the field of marketing. They're looking to use these kind of technologies to, to make uh, advertising more engaging. Yeah, so for example, using uh, Instagram filters, um, what, what else? Um, using virtual reality for training simula simulation. So all these like immersion um, is up and coming. Lah. Yeah, so we don't really see that a lot in Singapore yet. Yeah, but I think that in the future, it will be a big thing. Yeah, so to start off, let me ask you guys, what is reality? Yeah, so without being too philosoph philosophical, right? I want to like, you know, have you all think about what is reality? You know? Yeah, so in this very classic scene from uh, The Matrix, right? Um, Amorphia says, if you're talking about what you can feel, what you can smell, what you can taste and see, then real is simply electrical signals interpreted by your brain. Right? So this is something that we are trying to recreate with um, virtual reality, especially virtual reality. Yeah? Not so much augmented reality, but virtual reality. We want to create this experience of um, immersion, complete immersion, so that the user will be transported into a different world. Yeah, so first, virtual reality. Um, virtual reality is an artificial environment where you're completely occluded from the external world. So um, your senses are completely blocked off. Or oh, this, this is the ideal. Um, at least visually, many headsets completely occlude your vision from the outside world and now transport you into a digital world, right? Then there's also the audio aspect to it. So many headsets nowadays also come with the accompanying music and um, 
we're still missing the sense of smell and taste, um, but something like this could very well be included in headsets in the future. Yeah, so to create a very immersive experience, we will need to uh, tackle all of these senses, right? Hope you are still following. Yeah, next we have augmented reality. So augmented reality, I think, first came into the public eye when Google Glass um, um, came out. I think when it came out, early 2010, around there, is it? Around that range. Yeah, so um, it was simply a glass display, like a heads-up display, like the one in the top left-hand corner here, where it will have um, prompts to, to uh, give you information, you know, augment your everyday life, give you small snippets of information that is not too intrusive. And it is the overlay of digital elements in your um, physical world. Yeah, so there's this uh, difference from uh, virtual reality. Virtual reality, you're completely occluded, but for augmented reality, you still can look into the real world and the virtual elements or digital elements are overlaid. Yeah, so these are some examples that you can find. So on the top right is a simple demonstration of uh, how you can add digital elements into the real world on a table. Uh, on the bottom left is Pokemon Go. So this is something that many of you might have had exposure with. Uh, considering that it's a very popular game, especially with the elderly. <laughs> uh, and on the bottom right is uh, an example of how uh, AR has been used in the media as well to create more immersive experiences. You know, so they um, use the magazine as a tracking marker and are overlaying the digital content uh, on the magazine. Yep. Yeah. So this one unassuming um, version of augmented reality. Yeah, so I, I think that many people fail to recognize that filters are uh, a form of augmented reality that we uh, see on a day-to-day -day basis, especially if you're very, um, if you're a frequent user of uh, Instagram or TikTok. Next, we have mixed reality. I think it was uh, Microsoft who came up with the with this term to sell their, their HoloLens. Uh, they tried to differentiate themselves from um, the typical augmented reality experiences. So back then, the augmented reality headsets, they didn't really have any understanding of the environment um, and simply overlaid the digital content, right? But the, the promise of mixed reality um, by uh, Microsoft with their whole lens and Magic Leap, right? Is that their headsets can understand the environment. So they do this through um, depth cameras uh, and the depth cameras uh, are able to create a spatial map of the environment. And with this spatial map, the device can position the digital objects in the, in the spatial environment, in the physical environment, accurately as if it was actually part of the physical uh, environment. Yeah, so this will make you feel that the object is physically there. This is as, as opposed to um, not being able to map out the environment and having uh, objects occlude each other incorrectly. So occlusion is uh, something that we humans take for granted in that uh, we use it to perceive depth, right? For example, um, I've got my, my cup here, my wallet here. And just because my cup is being occluded by my wallet, you know that the cup is behind. And so for this kind of information to be processed by the, the system to accurately position or accurately um, portray the, the object, it needs to know what the environment is like so that uh, by creating a spatial mesh of, let's say, a chair, Whatever digital objects that go behind the chair should be occluded and should be hidden, should be partially hidden, right? Yeah, so um, in recent years, um, many lower end devices, like for example, um, mobile phones, uh, they are also increasingly getting more, power, more and more powerful. So they also have the depth features, which is why this like augmented reality and mixed reality line is really getting blurred. Yeah, so it's about the same. Yeah, it's about the same. Yeah. Okay, next. Yeah, so I wanted to talk about how AR and VR is actually just an illusion. 
yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if any of you have actually tried out some of the AR and VR uh, applications. Um, if you wear a VR headset and you feel like you're being transported to another dimension, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say, but it's not real. Um, it's just an illusion and this is facilitated um, by your senses being uh, completely immersed, right? Yeah, so I wanted to talk about the difference between immersion and presence, right? So immersion is the objective degree of sensory fidelity of the platform or the product that you're using. So how many sensors are being immersed in that environment? I mentioned to you earlier about how the sense of the taste and, and smell is kind of lacking. But uh, I think we have achieved uh, in many examples, um, visual, um, the audio, and also the haptic, haptic feedback. Yeah, so I, th I think later, uh, I, I might be able to show you in the slides uh, one example of a haptic feedback. Yeah, so all of these uh, elements will make you feel that you are in the, in the virtual world. And um, presence is something that we want to achieve. It is the end goal. So Im immersion is just like the means. Then presence is the end goal for the end user to be, how do, how do I put it, convinced that they are in another world or convinced that this digital object is in front of them. Yeah, so presence is limited by immersion. If your immersion is, is, is uh, not too good, then your presence is also not too good. Yeah, do let me know if I'm speaking too fast. Okay, I, I think everyone should be fine. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, next. Some jargon that you might see when you are shopping for virtual reality or metal reality headsets, yeah? So HMD is head mounted display. This refers to um, the device that you know sits on top of your, your head. <laughs> as, as with the uh, previous slide, you'll see the Magic Leap and HoloLens. Um, yeah, they are getting to be quite consumer friendly in terms of the, the price. Uh, I think the Oculus Quest 2 um, is just like around three four hundred dollars only. Yeah, so it's, it's very, very much affordable. So degree of freedom um, refers to um, I'm, I'm tempted to say how free the, the object is, but it's, it's actually um, how many axes can the object move or be or be detected, right? Uh, field of view is how much um, how much uh, digital content can be overlaid. So in virtual reality, you typically have wider field of views because the headset is completely occluding your, your eyes. So the screen is very close to your, to your eyes and, and you can render quite a wide field of view. I think about like 130 degrees field of view. Uh, whereas for augmented reality headsets like um, uh, HoloLens and Magic Leap, their field of view is typically smaller. Uh, this is because of the limitations in the, the hardware, hardware glasses. You know, they try to project some stuff in front of you. So it's like not very, not very immersive. And so this one problem that is being faced by um, mixed reality headsets is that even though they can create the illusion that objects are there, but you always see that a large part of it is cropped out. Yeah, that's for this field of view. Yeah, here there's some uh, illustration of what I meant earlier about degree of freedom. Yeah, so you always see 3DOF, 6DOF, 9DOF, right? Um, and it's just more and more accuracy in terms of being able to detect the, the headset or the controller. Yeah, so uh, yeah. for headsets, uh, I'm sure I, should, I, will mention, I will talk about this later. Yeah, so for tracking systems, right? There's two main tracking systems out there that are used in uh, any kinds of AR, VR devices. Uh, first is uh, outside in tracking, where, whereby there's like external cameras or sensors that track the position of the headset. Um, and the second is inside out. So the headset itself uh, consists of um, sensors and gyroscopes, accelerometers, and also cameras to position, to, look, to find the location of the headset with respect to the, the, the physical world. Yeah. So here are some examples of um, commercial products, commercial VR systems, and the relevant and, and their tracking system that they're using. Uh, for 
outside in tracking systems, it typically are able to locate you very well, but they will have to do a lot of math to find out what is your orientation. Yeah. I won't go into the math, don't worry. Yeah. And for inside out, it's kind of the opposite. You have onboard sensors. So you know what your orientation is, but you don't really know where you are with respect to the, the surroundings. And the system has to use this buzzword sensor fusion to combine all of this information to properly locate you in the environment. And I, and I think that uh, the Oculus Quest 2 has done it really well. Yeah. And so going back to the degree of freedom topic just now, right? Uh, one example of uh, how why degree of freedom matters is that for a headset with a low degree of freedom, for example, three degree of freedom, it, it, typically, it typically means that you can only look around in the environment, but not be able to move around in your physical environment. Probably didn't make any sense, <laughs> but um, what I mean is that um, there's no translational movement uh, when you're wearing the headset. So that's for three degree of freedom headsets. But I, I think nowadays we, we don't really have that anymore. Uh, the problem with that is that in the ex if you're wearing the headset and if you're moving your head from side to side, your view doesn't really change. It only rotates. So this might give you some motion sickness or uh, dissonance between what you're feeling and what you're seeing. Yes, which is why typically headsets with six degree of freedom or more are, are better. Yeah, uh, bigger, bigger is better. Yeah. So I want to talk about some um, common interactions that uh, AR and VR platforms uh, utilize to create the experiences. Yeah, so eye tracking versus eye tracking. Yeah, so I, I, I think um, this is, uh, how, do I, how do I put it? Is there's a distinction between eye tracking and eye tracking. Many headsets or many products like to, to sell eye tracking when in fact it's not really eye tracking. Um, I like to call it uh, gaze tracking instead. So eye tracking or gaze tracking refers to you wearing the, the headset and um, because when you're moving around, the headset renders different things, you kind of guess the, the gaze of, the, of the, the user by using the headset as a proxy. So you use the headset's direction as a proxy of, of where the user is looking at, as opposed to actually tracking your, your pupils and looking at where you are, you are, you are, are looking at. So eye tracking, real eye tracking, really it, it typically requires um, more hardware because you need to have the cameras within the headset and detect the your eye eyeballs. And so, so one um, use case would be to create something like this, a uh, heat map, you know, to show to your clients or, or, or whoever, like, oh, which part of the experience is interesting to my to my customer or the user, right? So gaze tracking is really like a, a, simple, a simplified version of eye tracking. They use um, the headset's direction as a proxy for where you're looking at. But eye tracking is the legit, um, accurate um, form of eye tracking. Can you catch me so far? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Next, we have got controllers. Yeah, so controllers is like uh, another way of interaction. So beyond just looking at things, right? You've also got to, you also can use controllers to reach out for elements in the scene or maybe um, select elements in the menu. Yeah, so controllers are, um, are proxies for your hands in, in the virtual world. It's for you to be able to um, interact with objects, you know? Uh, and it's your, how do I put it, the bridge for you in the physical world into the virtual world. Yeah, so uh, I like to think about it. Um, this is useful because imagine if you didn't have controllers and all you had was the headset, right? It's like you can only interact by looking around, but you cannot, um, you cannot trigger any events in the scene. 
and everything only happens around you. So with controllers now, you have the ability to move around um, using maybe the touchpad uh, and the teleporting. Yeah, so there's many there are different kinds of um, design decisions behind um, how the designers want the player to move around in the game. And uh, different games will have different locomotion, uh, yeah, locomotion designs. Yeah. And controllers, they come in like all shapes and sizes. On the left, we have got the HTC Vive's controller, and on the right, we've got the HTC, no, not HTC, the Vive Index, or the Vive in, uh, Handles uh, controller. Yeah. And similar to headsets, um, how they have three degree of freedom, six, six degree of freedom, controllers also have this kind of um, variations as well. In the simplest form, a controller can be as simple as a clicker, which is basically zero degree of freedom because you don't detect the position of the, of the controller at, at all. Um, this can be used to select things that you're looking at, for example. So in conjunction with case tracking, you could look at, uh, let's say, a carton of milk, for example, and then you click on it, then you're like, oh, let me buy that kind of thing. Yeah, so that's the simplest um, version of a controller. Then uh, with a three degree, three degree and six degree freedom of contro a controller, you can do more things. You can interact with more elements and you can see the controller in virtual reality. And so that makes for a more immersive experience. Yeah, so actually over here, I've got a Google Cardboard, right? Uh, inside there's a, a magnet that acts like a button. So you just click on it, click on it, and then it will it will cause the mobile phone to have fluctuations in the magnetic field and then it will trigger the button. So this is like the simplest form of button, which is to which is which only does one thing. So click. Right. And next we've got hand tracking. So hand tracking is quite uh cutting edge in that uh, there aren't many products that really use hand tracking. Uh, and also they are trying to find use cases for it. Um, one reason why it's very cool is because uh, it's, it's um, the most intuitive form of interaction. So when the first iPhone came out, Steve Jobs, you know, he said, um, the handphone is going to be rev revolutionized by the iPhone because we're using the most intuitive pointing device that we're all born with, you know, the finger, right? Yeah, so I think this is the equivalent. Hand tracking would be the equivalent of, of uh, touching on the iPhone, iPhone. Yeah, and Oculus, uh, HTC Vive, and Microsoft have been playing around with hand tracking for a couple of years now. And yeah, hopefully we'll see uh, some games coming out of, of, uh, from them. Yeah. Uh, the reason why it's still in beta is because uh, for hand tracking, uh, currently the systems use the front-facing cameras on the headset to track the hands. Uh, and they typically have a limited field of view. So when you hold your hands out in front of you, it's fine, the tracking is fine. But when you move beyond certain field of view, sometimes the tracking gets kind of wonky because it has very little information of what it knows about your hands. Yeah, so it's less reliable than controllers. So controllers, uh, if I say you are using an outside in tracking system, the controllers can be detected even if it's behind you because of the external cameras, uh, which is why um, many uh, industrial systems might prefer higher precision systems that are outside in. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Yeah, so next, I wanted to go through some of the simple VR and AR demonstrations. And, and um, through this, I was hoping to also um, teach you some um, 3D graphics concepts that might be, uh, would definitely be useful when you are exploring this kind of uh, AR, VR things. And so AR and VR, you can't really do it well without the hardware. This is, that's my, my personal take. If I were to do this um, post COVID, uh, I, I think it would be great if we all, could all have like a, access to a headset to try out what the virtual world is like, but I guess we have to make do. And so um, we've modified the workshop to utilize um, web frameworks and, exp and we're exploring um, how to use browser-based uh, AR and VR frameworks. 
and uh, hopefully this will be accessible to you guys as well. Uh, and, and, I, and I cannot see your, your screen, so I, I don't know if you're struggling and I don't know that if you are lost. And this is not meant to be a hardcore programming workshop. It's more, more like a, a copy and paste and we'll try to share with you some uh, of the concepts. Okay, yeah, so let's give it a go. Yeah, so these are some concepts um, that we will be covering during the, as we go through the, the demonstration. Huh? Okay. So it would be great if you could, if you guys could go to this link, succulent beaded map. On the computer or yeah, on your on your computer. Yeah. yeah, let me get the link for you guys and mm -hmm. paste it. Do you have any questions so far? We've got the most dry parts out of the way already, actually. I pasted the link in. Yep. You, you. Yeah, so when you enter the, the web website, right, um, you will see something a bit different. Uh, I think there should be a fork button somewhere. I can't see it because this is my own project. Oh, oh, uh, Maybe I should open it. Can you see the fault button? Where's the fault button? Can you sign in? Yeah, I think you, you, you might want to sign in. So uh, we've got a project here that is uh, uh, oh, set up yeah. for you to play around with. So you, you might want to log in to clone this project uh, and then you can follow along. All right. Let me open this in incognito so that maybe it's easier that way. Incognito. Oh, maybe they don't know what's fork. I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry for using such big words. Let me share my other screen. Okay. Can you all see my screen? Can you see my screen? Yep. Right. Um, yeah, so this will be like a preview of what we're going to be creating. And you can view this in, in virtual reality, hopefully. And so we, we will start with the, the base project. And so when, when I mentioned about forking, right? Uh, I meant remix in, in Glitch. So Glitch is a platform for, for, for um, lazy people who don't want to set up any like backend nonsense to tinker around with HTML and CSS stuff. So we're using this to um, render a very simple VR scene. Yeah. I think. Try, try something. If I sign in, I think it'll be different. Oh. How do I? Do you need to sign in to demo this? Not yet. Um, can I confirm that you, you guys are seeing something similar? <laughs> seeing something. This is my screen now. But no, it's in like from in your own your in your own project. You know, do you see something similar? Yeah. It is at this time in a physical environment. I will walk around and I will check your your screen and see if you are on the same page. <laughs> Yeah, so uh yeah, so if you're on the same page, let's go to index.html and modify line 18. Let's change this to uh base, okay? Base. And it's from here we will start to oh I can't edit here. Hold on. Yeah, base. Yeah. In fact, yeah, in, in fact, you can even um just look at my screen and just do it, you know. 
Yeah, right? You can refresh the project that I that I uh, hosted, the succulent beaded map, to always look at the latest project that um we're working on. Right? How do you get to the index HTML? How do you get to the index HTML? Um it's on the left side. You click on this JSM, is it? No, 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 it's not in not in oh, there, okay, I see. Yeah, it's just there. Yeah. Can you get it? Sorry, the project's a little messy. I I I um threw this together real real quick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Pardon, pardon it. Yeah. So uh hope everyone is seeing this uh, nice black screen on the right side. Yeah. In your project. Right? You you should see this because it is uh there's nothing going on in the project. If you look into um the VR cubes underscore base file, this is this file is being referenced in the in the HTM, in the HTML file. So maybe a quick quick crash course on the HTML. <laughs> this is the HTML CSS course in two minutes. Okay. So when we uh when we what we're looking on the right side, right, is basically um a rendered version of the HTML um code that we are writing uh, on the left side in this index HTML uh, uh, file, right? And on the top, yeah, I mean, you'll, you'll see a lot of tags, HTML, head, title, meta, all these tags, not very important. Uh, what's important is that we are loading a bunch of stuff that, will, uh, that we'll be using in our, the code that we're going to be modifying. So everything from line one to 17 and 19 to 20, they are not relevant to you if you don't know HTML. Only line eighteen is relevant. <laughs> I oh uh, I forgot to ask. Uh, you, can you see my screen? Is it is it clear? Is it too small? I will make it bigger. Make it big, big, big. Yeah, hopefully this is better. Yeah, this is okay. Both. Is it too big? Yeah, bigger is better. Right? Yeah, okay. That's great. That's great. Okay, so um, the source file here, VR cubes base, is the file that we're going to be modifying, uh, and. When I enter, when I view the website, this is the script that runs. All right. And where is this file? It's right up here. I should have named it something better because you can't see it. <laughs> yeah, it's VR cubes uh, underscore base. Please, all right. Okay, yeah. yeah, so just giving you the, the rundown. Uh, so this is JavaScript in two minutes, okay? <laughs> uh, in JavaScript, you can uh, import different um, the modules and also you know, instantiate variables. Uh, I wanted, to, I would have asked, you know, how confident are you guys in JavaScript? And you would say, I'm very good at JavaScript and we're going to continue. Yeah, so uh, when this JavaScript is, is uh, uh, loaded, right, these two functions, init and animate, are, are called. And um, yeah, that, that's, that's pretty much it. Yeah. So the initialization function, um, does the initialization things, basically setting up all of the HTML stuff that we will need for our project. And then um, I've written down some placeholder code or comments um, where we can throw in our, our um, code later. The rest are all really just helper functions that make everything work, right? Mm -hmm. The important thing is the render function as well. So the render function, um, will be called on every frame of the simulation, the virtual reality simulation. Yeah, so uh, if you want things to happen or, or be changed on every frame update, then this is the place to put it, all right? Let's start with step zero, well, with which we need to instantiate a new scene, all right? So how do we do that? We're just going to do some copy pasting. So. Uh, on the left side, I've got a lot of different files representing each of the steps. Yep. So if you just can you just follow along, uh, we'll just create a scene uh, by you know, using the three JS uh, framework. So the three three JS is actually uh, a library that allows you to do cool three D things, and we're using that uh, in conjunction with WebXR to um, demonstrate some of the VR concepts, right? Yeah, so the scene is this base on which we will add elements. So the elements would include 
the camera, which is the user yourself, and also the environment and the other interactable elements that you might want to add. Um, I think it might be good to make a short segue to like what is actually 3GS and what next are. Let me let me do that. Okay. 3GS. Yep. Yep. So 3GS can look at all of these nice um projects that have been that have been created using 3GS and uh, they are generally uh the you know not, not, not really VR centric but more um 3D centric, yeah, because 3GS, right? Yeah, so all these projects are, are all made using this library, and uh, there's some VR projects here as well, yeah, like within, within the VR project. It's uh, one of the very early VR projects, yeah. Uh, A-Frame here is another library specifically for um, augmented reality, is um, is okay, augmented reality and virtual reality. So this library will help you to um help you to write AR and VR applications in a HTML-like syntax. Um, but the reason why we're not using this is because you need to know a lot of HTML. Or at least you need to, I, I think it's, it's a little bit more complicated. Yeah. But it is something you can explore in the future. Yeah, but for now, we're using 3JS because they've got, it's a lower level library and allows you to play around with more of the 3D concepts that we're going through today. Yep. So that's that. Okay. So, um, we're going to instantiate the, the scene here and we're going to set the background to be um, a shade of gray. Right? And you might be wondering, where is my shade of gray? I, all I see is black because you, 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 we haven't created a camera nor rendered the scene. Yep, so let's do that um, by by writing this. Yeah. So I'm going to type it out. Um, in the meantime, you, you can copy and paste from the, <laughs> the steps on the left if you're lazy to copy and paste. Uh, if you're lazy to type it out. Yeah. So we're going to instantiate a new camera. Yeah. So now, uh, all these um, variables I'm keying in, they're actually um, defining how the camera um, looks like. Not, not really looks like, but they are, how do you put it? The positions? Not, not positions, but rather the size of the camera and how much you can look. So I mentioned uh, earlier about the field of view. Yeah. So this will, this relates to, to the, the Fustrum which is being rendered. Sorry for throwing the jargon again. <laughs> Please call me on that. Uh, then we're going to set the camera to a different position because the origin is um, not the best place to put the camera. Yeah, so this is a very simple way to position the camera. I think it's pretty straightforward. We're instantiating a new camera and we're just changing the position to be 0, 1.6, and 3. Uh, these are arbitrary values. You can, off, you can, of course, put in whatever you want. You can even change the color to um, not gray or we, we modify it later. Yeah, but maybe for ease, you can just use the same values. Um, but you might be asking, Francis, what the heck? It's still black, oh my goodness. <laughs> it's like horrid, right? And you're right, it's horrid. Yeah, so we actually need to modify the, the render um, function a little because we need to write the information to the camera, right? Uh, and uh, we need to use the render function on the renderer. <laughs> and put in the scene and camera. Yeah. So this gives information to the, the renderer to use the camera to render, to render the scene. Wow. Uh, are we doing okay, guys? Yep. Are we doing okay, guys? Give me a, give me a thumbs up. Give me one thumbs up. I got, I got one, I got, I got two, I got two. Wow, guys, thanks. Thanks. Yeah, solid, solid. <laughs> yeah. So now we got the, we got a gray screen. Wow. We're making so much progress here, guys. It's like so so virtual, so augmented. <laughs> um, yeah, so we're gonna populate the scene with a, a room that we can actually see because we, we we don't know what's happening, right? Oh, actually, before that, let's try to view this on our phones. Yeah, so you can see on the bottom right that VR is not supported, right? Yeah, so you can actually view this in your in your phone um when you press. Uh, in a new window, then you'll give you the link. Oh, actually, you can see here, so I think. 
I think I can see the link somewhere. Where's the link? Uh, tools, tools, tools. Export. Then you can get the link. Where's my link? Oh, okay, not so important. Just, just go here. Just click in a new window. And then you get the link with which you can access your, your project. Yeah, so you copy this link and um, put it into your favorite um, messaging application of choice. Um, for me, is for me is Zoom chat because that's my favorite. I talk to all my friends on Zoom. So, so, so. Um, okay, just kidding. Um, you use Telegram or something and uh, send this link to your phone. Okay, uh, I will join the call from my phone and you will see what's it like on my phone. Okay, hold on. I will share screen. Cannot share it. What the? Oh, okay. I need to stop sharing screen here first. Hold on, okay. I'm going to show you what is it like on my phone. Can you see my phone? Yeah. Okay, my phone. Please, please, um, don't mind my messy <laughs> phone. <laughs> yep. So we're looking at the exact same thing, but now on the phone and. Lo and behold, we got, the gray. We, got the, we got the gray screen. <laughs> and more importantly, we have got the enter VR button. And this is the point in the in the in the workshop where you go, we're entering the Matrix boys uh, and, and girls. Yeah. yeah. So we enter, <laughs> we go into VR. Whoa, look at that. So the reason why there's two, two screens, right, is because um this kind of VR experience, mobile VR experience, they typically uh, ex expect you to have something like this, which is like a, a headset and some lenses uh, to curve the image and warp the image into, into something that, that fits your eyes and uh, creates the illusion. Uh, not really Google Glass. Uh. It's not Google Glass. Oh, yeah, no, no, this is no, Google, Google Cardboard. This, Google this Cardboard. is Google Cardboard. Yeah, yeah. so um, with the lenses, right, they will curve the image and let you see things with depth. So the two images that you that are rendered are slightly different. Yeah, we, we'll see that later. Okay. Yeah. So remember what we have now in the scene. Okay. All we have is the um camera and a gray scene. Okay. So you just put it in, so you just put it inside. And then I will I, I look inside. Wow, it's it's amazing. I'm in the virtual world. It's all gray. Yeah, so not very exciting. <laughs> Back, back to the, the project. But if you can get to this stage, it's, 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 it's great. Yeah. So if you manage to enter virtual reality by pushing the button, we made it. We're done here, guys. We're done. Okay, I, I'm going to have to stop sharing for my phone. Hold on. Is there any easier way for me to stop sharing? Just press. Stop sharing, okay. Okay, I'm going back to the into my window here yeah so uh I, I don't want to be going to and fro too many times so uh we'll 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 do that when when something iconic happens okay um yeah so for now you, you have this uh and we'll you know even though we were in the virtual world just now we couldn't make sense of anything because everything was gray my goodness so <laughs> disgusting yeah so we're going to <laughs> We're going to add some um, visuals that will allow us to use as reference when we, when we look around. Yeah, so we're going to add a simple room, okay? Okay, we're going to add a simple room. And we do this by first picking a room. Yeah, so this room is going to be made up of um, many line segments. It's not going to be a very pretty room. It's, it's, it's just what it is. Um, feel free to copy and paste, okay? I'm, I'm just doing it the hard way because uh, at least you can see what's going on here. Um, uh, for all those who are non-programmers, feel free to copy and paste and I hope that uh, through this workshop, you also um, feel a little bit of the, the pain of, of programming, I mean the joy of programming. But I'm just curious, right? Yeah. For, for this for these numbers, they're also arbitrary, is it? like by try and error. Uh yeah. there some so so this box line geometry is actually um how do I put it? 
um, defining the width and the height of the of the the grid stator you see. Okay, okay. Yeah, but yeah, they're, they're pretty much arbitrary. Yeah. So, uh, the color refers to the the lines that you see later. Um, mm -hmm. we still can't see anything because you know why? We didn't add the room to the scene. Yeah. So whenever we create an object, right, we also need to add it into the scene so that we can see it. Ah, did I make an error? Did I make an error? Tree, no, I think it's here. So I'm looking at the debug. Not a constructor. Oh, sorry, I missed out a very key component. The S. <laughs> yeah, key component. Oh, there we go. Thanks. Guys, we got it. We got it. Okay, we got the nice gray room. All right. Okay, then uh, next, uh, in, the, in the scene, right, right now, there, um, in the virtual world, there's the, um, as with the real world, in the three-dimensional, we have X, Y, and Z coordinates. Yeah, so we want to add a, a helper function for us to, or not helper function, helper object to, see what's it like you know or to see what the directions and which way is up which way is left right xyz yep so we're going to do this by adding a axis helper function in a similar way we're going to use the arbitrary function that you don't know <laughs> um, the number here in axis helper actually refers to the length of the, the coordinate you'll see the object yeah uh, then we're going to assign it to a position that is easy for us to see. So our camera is actually at 0, 1, 6, 0 0.6 entry. So we're going, to move, we're going to put this slightly in front of us. Actually, oh my goodness. Did they? Did they? Oh my goodness, did they stop me? Oh my word. This project, uh, can I? I think I, I didn't expect this to be so overloaded. I think they really, really limited me. <laughs> yeah, so uh, this is a little troubling. Uh. Maybe I just reset this. I think okay. Reset. Let's change. Oh no, then I won't be succulent beaded anymore. Yeah, so I think uh, this is really quite problematic. I think I can uh, fork the project again. Yeah, I think I will remix it. Yeah, I think it should be fine. Now I'm resonant noon coyote. Okay, sorry, sorry guys. There's a, a technical hic hiccup. I um we'll, we'll just use this new project instead. All right. Yeah, okay, we're back. We're back. <laughs> don't don't come to this website. <laughs> don't come to this link. <laughs> don't <laughs> crash this. Yeah, okay. Uh everything should be the same. Uh, continue. Yeah, so this happens when you use uh, products that are that don't expect to be used in a workshop. <laughs> yeah, so we create the axis helper and we add it to a scene. So you can see it here. Uh, the green line is the uh, y axis. Here I should add a command. Yeah. Oh, uh, just for those who don't are unfamiliar with JavaScript, uh, to write comments, you use uh, the double slash. Right, uh, and you can use it to um, write stuff that doesn't actually impact the code or the program in any in any way. Yep. The z axis is blue. Uh, yeah, blue. Yeah. So z axis is blue. Um, the y is green, and the and the x is red. Right. So if let's say I were to change this to one, you should expect it to move to the right. So one unit, yep. Can you can see that, right? Move to the right. And if you want to make it move up, you can increment the Y. Yeah. Yeah, so this is how the coordinate system works. So this is the world coordinate system and um, the camera, you, are just one element in this world right so um beyond this 
there are smaller coordinate systems. For example, if let's say, uh, we're not going to go through this today, but you could also create new coordinate systems that allow other objects to be nested within each other. Oh, is 000 automatically set to be the center of your room? Um, uh, yes, it's, it's automatically set to be the center of the room. I think it should be. And uh, but your camera is not because the camera or the camera we set it to be 0, 1.63. Yeah. So we're actually uh slightly floating above the floor. I hope that answers your question, Nicholas. Yeah. If you set it to be 0, 0, 0, you will see that the uh coordinate system will be at 0, 0, 0, like in the center of the room. Right. Uh, I'm I'm not going to go into the handphone view for now uh, because nothing interesting yet. But you can you can try it out, and uh, and it should look fantastic. Yeah. So next we're going to add some cubes into the scene because our our room has like nothing, right? So it's going to dump more geometry inside. Yeah. So geometry. Yeah, so what I'm doing now is defining the mesh that we'll be using, or mesh or geometry that we'll be use, using to, or using the geometry to define the mesh. Okay. Yeah. So um, I I am not sure whether or not we can unpack this now, but in essence, this function box geometry helps us to define a, a mesh using the, you know, the X, Y, Z, the size of the box. So because all of these values are the same, we are defining a cube here actually. Yeah, so let's create my first cube. Okay, not my first cube, it's gonna be our first cube because we are inclusive. Yeah, so with the ge geometry that we defined earlier, I'm going to create a new cube. So again, the color here is arbitrary, um, and you can copy and paste the code from VR Cubes tree. It should be right here. Yep, it's the same thing. Uh, I should also rename this back to my first cube because then it will be consistent with the rest of the code. <laughs> yeah. So again, we don't see the cube. Do you know why? <sighs> because we always forget to add the first cube, not add the object to the scene. And when I say we, I mean me. <laughs> and we don't have it. Where is the cube? All oh, right. Like, so we didn't define the position of the cube. So the cube is actually literally right below us and we, we can't see it, right? So step four, very crucial. We're going through so many steps just to get the cube out, right? Oh my goodness. This virtual thing is really got to go. So we're going to set the position to somewhere nearer to the coordinate, the, the axis helper object. Okay. Hope that uh, you guys are still following. I'll ask for a thumbs up later. <laughs> oh my goodness, we did it guys. Yes, we got a cube. Yes. <laughs> so much effort just to get a cube out. We got a dog. Huh? A dot. A dot? Oh. <laughs> yeah, so you just need yeah, so the so the, the, the cube, right, is oh the yeah, the cube is um not very fantastic. And also uh if you notice earlier we defined the cube to be zero f f uh, zero x f f zero 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 zero. So this is actually in a hexadecimal decimal, you know, RGB format. Yep. So um this actually means red. Yeah, I'm not gonna go into why this means red, but we can do a quick segue to what is HTML. I mean, hexadecimal, hexadecimal color codes. Pick your favorite color. Yeah, so as you can see here, red is FF0000. Yeah, you can pick a different color if you want. Yeah, uh, and uh, yeah, so 
we define it to be red, why is it not red? Because this scene has no lights. Yeah, so light is a very important um, thing in the world. <laughs> yeah, imagine in, in your physical room, you turn on if you turn off the lights, everything seems dark. And in a similar way, this is what's happening right now. Right. So we need to add some illumination. Yep. And how might we do that? You might ask. Thank you for asking. We're adding some um, light. And then we can also define the color of the light, you know. Okay. Okay. Just with the light, we already have got somewhere. Uh, yeah. We can also add directional light, you know, if you want to make things more fancy. So directional light, um, I mean, it's, it's kind of self-explanatory in that it is uh, directional and will only come in from a particular direction. So you have shadows and this will make the scene look more realistic. We can set the position of the light to be way above us. And we're going to add this add the light into the scene. So the reason why we didn't need to do this we, we, in this step here, line 68, we actually combined the creation of the light source and adding it to the scene in one line. Yeah. So this is um more steps, right? Yep, so we got the, the, the cube. Let's make it move so that we can have some interesting visuals later. Okay, let make, let's make the cube spin. Step six, easy peasy. Still following, right? Oh, I I will want to give you all some time to uh, check out what you have, like what, what does it look like now? Later, after this um, cube has been is spinning. Yeah, so, what we're going to be doing is to use the clock object in this um, program uh, and use that as a variable to rotate the cube. Yeah, so uh, I'm going to get, get delta. So del delta refers to the, how to put this? It's a, small, it's a small unit of change since the previous frame. Yeah, in the unit of timer. Yeah, so we're going to get the first cube from the room object, and the room object has a lot of children, and the and the first children, the first child that we that we um, placed in the room is the the cube, right? So if I scroll back up, the first thing that we added is the cube. Well, the first thing we added is the helper. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I think you should. Oh no, wait. The first thing we added to the room is the cube. Yeah, so so it's right. So the, the room is in the scene, the cube is in the room. Other things that are in the scene is the helper, the, ex, the axis helper, the coordinate system thingy, uh, and the light source are also in the scene. But the, ro the room itself uh, only has one cube. Okay, so we're gonna get the first uh, cube. Yeah, so right here. Let's make it move. First cube. So the plus equal sign uh, here, right, refers to uh, adding 0 0.01 to the existing value of my cube rotation. I think you can do it this way as well. Like so, instead of doing this, we could also have done it this way for the non-programmers out there. This might be easier to understand. Yeah, so we're assigning the we're assigning the new value, new value to the old value, as right, into the, the the variable, the variable. Yeah. So we're multiplying by delta because that's the smallest unit. So if you uh, want the cube to spin faster, look at that, it's spinning. Wow. If you want the cube to spin faster, you can just change the the speed. Yeah. I'm actually going to comment this out because I think it's ruining everything. Spin faster, let's make it 10. 
Okay, yeah. Sorry that, that yeah. So made it spin faster. Get a few more cubes here. Let me get a few more rotation. It's going on here. Don't want to rotate so fast because it's a bit crazy. Yeah. Okay, we got it. We got it, guys. Okay, next I'm going to preview this in the in the in the mobile phone. Are, are we do, are we doing good? This this is the 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 step where whereby we um view it in the on our mobile phone. So I need to get this link again because it's a different link. Okay. So this is what you should be seeing in your phones. Uh, okay. I'm going to be sharing the screen on my phone again. Hold on. Um, also, I, uh, are you still okay? Still following along? Have any pressing questions? Even if they're not pressing, you can still ask. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, ask me anything you want. Okay, okay. Oh, yeah. So we're on my phone, right? Great. Oh, this is the old link, sorry. I need to get myself the new link. <laughs> Stop share. This workshop is so terrible. Nice. You're, you're looking at me playing my phone. <laughs> Look at this. <laughs> Look at this. Do you all see what I see? I, I don't see it. <laughs> Sorry, I'm waiting for my, my telegram to load. Sorry. It's a little slow. <laughs> I can't believe the bottleneck is my telegram. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> it's just loading slowly. Take, taking its own sweet time. Can you send to you on the chat? Okay, chat can actually. But it's okay, I, I got it. Oh my goodness, how am I opening the link with by two? <laughs> what? What's going on? Oh my goodness. Okay, sorry guys. My phone is a little bit wonk. <laughs> but in any in any case, you guys should be seeing this. Okay. Uh, oh, you should be seeing the spinning rate cube. Okay, I, I think I will wait for my, my phone to load and we'll move on <laughs> first. Yeah, you should be seeing something like this uh, in the virtual world. Uh, yeah, this is what our scene looks like now. Kind of boring, right? Yeah, but I, I hope that you all have gotten like some fundamental ideas of what, uh, what makes a virtual scene. I hope. Yeah, so um, JavaScript is just one way for us to programmatically add elements into the scene. I mean, I think other languages would work as well. I, but, but I mean, JavaScript is really great for the web. Um, yeah, I'll talk more about the other softwares later. Yeah, so let's make the scene more exciting. So this is not very relevant to augmented reality now. It's just to make the scene look, more, look better. So um, bear with me, we'll just very quickly rush through this. Okay, we're gonna add more cubes, okay? We're gonna add more cubes. Okay, you no, know I'm just gonna copy and paste it. I'm gonna copy and paste because it's a whole chunk of code. Yeah, I'm gonna skip to step eight. Yeah, so in step seven and step eight, right, what we're doing here is that we are um we have a for loop and we're going to instantiate 200 more cubes, right? And uh we randomize the positions of the, the, for each cube, we will randomize their position. And at the same time, we also randomize their rotation and their scale. Basically, we just randomize the cubes in, a, in every way. Uh, also, the color of the cube is also randomized in this step here. 
in this set. Yeah, it's also randomized here, right? And we and then after that we um make the cubes move by adding some velocity to them. Yeah. So it's like a physics based kind of simulation ish thingy here, right? Um, but there's no collision, there's no physics. It's just it's just so collision physics, but there's still the movement physics. Yeah, so we're just adding the velocity to make the elements move. Uh, and finally we add it to the room. Yeah. So I'm going to just copy this whole chunk of code into my base project because the base project is the one that I'm using now. Yeah, edit here. Whoa, look at the scene. It's so cluttered. Right. Uh can y'all see? Can y'all see? Yeah. It's a uh, nice and populated, right? Oh. <laughs> yeah. Um Yeah. The one thing that um is not happening not right now is that the no, things are not they're not they're not moving, right? Yeah, no. It's because we, we didn't do anything to it in the, the render render part. Yeah. So we're going to have to edit that part now. Okay, let's again copy and paste from C9 because it's not so relevant to augmented empty and virtual reality. <laughs> <Not surprised. laughs> yeah, so a bunch of code that makes things move, right? Copy paste. <laughs> this is how we, this is what programmers do all the time. Come on. What's happening? Did I make an error somewhere? Oh my word. Oh my word. Hmm. Let me refresh this. Hold on, hold on. Oh, feels like I'm missing something. Where is the missing piece? Um, hold on. Oh, I mean, yeah, I think I, I left out something here. But I guess we're just going to have to live with our static scene. <laughs> okay. Uh, let me move to my phone again. Share the VR view again. Just so that, just in case you all don't have the, don't have any mobile phone next to you or cannot run it on your phone for some reason. Yeah. So it's unfortunate that the things are not spinning, but <laughs> at least it's, at least it's uh, there. Yep. So we're going to revert this. Share the screen. Yep. You can see this, right? Close and over this. Oh man, I need to close my soft share first. Are you following? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Noel. <laughs> Noel is like my number one supporter. Okay. Really matrix. Mm -hmm. Matrix. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, matrix. Whoa. Yep. Yep. Okay. There we go. Oh, I yep. So we can see all of the wonderful cubes in VR. So there's yeah I yeah there's there's no translational motion. So if you can see my my camera, is not my phone camera, but my, my camera camera. 
when I move closer, it does not really, you know, do anything. So this is what we call like three degree of freedom. So there's no control of moving to and fro. So it's just using like the accelerometer and the um Karosko information to render what should be um on the screen. Now. So um well it might seem pretty obvious to us, you know, humans that when we turn our head to the right, uh, if objects, if the object is still, then with respect to our eyes, the object is moving left. If I turn my head to the right, with respect to my eyes, the object is moving left, right? So this is something that's also happening in the, in the scene as well. So if I look at the uh, red cube, right, as I move my camera to the right, the red cube is actually moving left with respect to the headset, right? Yeah. So this, yeah. So this is like a small, like thing that actually has a lot of impact because um, this gives the illusion that the red cube is physically in our space in front of us because it respects. Um, what we, um, it, it respects what, how, how we assume a physical object that is not moving to behave. You, you, you get it? Yeah. yeah. Basically, it acts like a physical object. Okay. That's, that's all. Yeah. Okay. Thanks um, for bearing with me for this <laughs> short demo. Um, there's, there's another demo that I wanted to, to show you guys. Uh, or I just want to confirm that like all of you are still, still, still here. Maybe I will take a short one minute break and ask for some response. Are you guys still following? Yes. <laughs> Please give a slight indication. Thank you, guys. I, I, I see four, four. Wow. Yes. Guys, we, hit, we, hit a, we are at the peak participation for like. <laughs> yeah, do you have any questions so far? Yeah, let's see, chat. Oh, <laughs> oh just so. Okay. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Nicholas. Thanks, Nicholas. Yeah, hopefully, it's cool. Yeah, actually, the the um, these kind of augmented reality and virtual reality experiences, they are they typically um you you typically would have to build it into an application, and then um and then it will work better. So this web web XR um, framework, right, is actually relatively new. So about I think one year ago, this thing didn't exist. You you wouldn't be able to run all all, all of these things on the web. Yeah. So I I think it's it's quite quite a it's really awesome that we can do all these things nowadays on the web browser the reason being is because um web browsers they didn't have the capability to get so much information from the phone in the past but now there's a lot of apis being built on browsers to allow the uh applications the browser-based applications to access this information and then hence we can create all this cool cool stuff on the web on the web you know we don't have to install any application you can see this virtual reality stuff how great is that Pretty cool if you ask me. Um, yeah, so uh, I conducted a similar workshop a year and a half ago. And in that workshop, we um, did something completely different, which is uh, creating an Instagram filter. Not an Instagram filter, a Facebook filter. Like playing around with Spark AR Studio to um, create a simple augmented reality experience. Yeah, so that one uh, had a lot more uh, setup required. Yeah, so this is like a different way of presenting similar ideas and concepts. Yeah, so maybe it's a bit more complicated because there's a lot more code. Yeah, but at least don't have to install any any software, right? Yeah, and uh, we yeah, move on to the next part. Yeah, so we've covered some VR stuff. I wanted to show you some AR stuff because uh, that's what we are trying to sell, right? <laughs> yeah. So uh, if you go into the index or HTML file, you change the script into AR underscore paint. 
Yes, there's another example that, that I prepared just for you guys. Yeah, I hope it works. Yeah, so if you look into the AR Paint um, program, right, it's actually um, similar, a similar structure. You also have the init and the animate part, right, and the render animate part. Yeah. So actually, the previous scene, VR cubes and AR paint, um, these are example code from um three JS, but I, I adapted it to work in this platform uh, in Glitch, right? So let's see if this works. So you probably can't do this, but uh, I just press start AR right, and then you can see the thing move. Yeah. So so this indicates that the AR experience is working lah. So the reason why I can do this is because I installed this uh, extension called WebXR API Emulator, which you can go and install if you want, and Google it. WebXR, uh, yeah. But it's not very, not very important, uh, uh, because you can't really do anything here because this particular AR experience you will need to interact with the screen. Yeah. So maybe I, I will just jump back onto my phone and show you here. Yeah. Yeah. So. With the wonders of um, web AR or web XR, we can refresh the page. Okay, hold on. Uh. Let me share my screen again. And then y'all can see our private space. <laughs> uh, let me share. Let me, let me cancel this first. I'm going to be very careful. Can see this, right? Can see this? Can see my phone, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So we are not in like the AR experience. Yeah. So this is private space. Not kind of private space. It's just a red wall. <laughs> yeah. So you if you hold you hold onto the screen, you can actually see some ink. Up here, oh, yeah. right? Like, oh, look at that. Yeah, so what's happening here is that the phone is actually using the camera to um, make sense of the environment. You can see my painting drifting away because of the tracking. Uh. So it's, it's, a, it's a combination of using the gyroscope information, accelerometer information, and also the camera's information. So it, it'd be great if, if the camera can detect more environment, then the tracking will be more stable. Yeah, so what's important is that the thing that you're looking at should have a lot of uh, features. Features being maybe colorful. Don't look at a white wall. Don't look at a, look at a white floor. Look at something that has more pattern. Yeah. So this nice pattern ground is quite quite um good to use. Yeah. So I'm just gonna draw more star. <laughs> Whoa. Okay. Maybe I can try to actually draw some useful things. What do you mean to? What do you mean to draw? I think I'll just try to draw like the hackers logo. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's too difficult. Uh, anyone has suggestions, please put in the chat. I'm just gonna draw like hello world, okay? Classic. Hello. 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 Oh, it looks quite legit. What? Why do you look quite legit? It is legit. Hello. Right. Yeah. Wow. Cool, right? Yeah, so this is AR Painter, and all of this is running in the mobile browser. Isn't that cool? And I can look at this nice um, eight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just look like it. Okay, fine. Yeah, but I hope that y'all get the idea. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so that's something that you can try out with your phone right now. So, uh, uh, yeah, so you can try that out. Uh, remember to just modify the index.html uh, line. Uh, 18 to AR paint. Okay. okay. Yep. So that's about it for the demos. Yeah, I'm not sure what else you want to see. Oh, we can look at, we can look at more of the 3JS that demonstration. So uh 3JS. So what we are using just now is 3JS, right? So actually the examples came from here. Um, the ARP example is here. 
you can run it run it as well. Uh, just that you know if you want to modify the code, then you need to host it somewhere. So using something like Glitch is easy to modify. The source code is all, all on GitHub. You can look at the, the bottom right hand corner. That's the source code button. Then you just go to GitHub. Then you see all the source code there. Um, what might, what might, might be a bit different is that they import the the other modules locally. So I actually uh, modified the code to to uh, read it from the glitch program itself. I mean the glitch uh, folder itself. Yeah, the glitch glitch project. Yeah. So I, I modified most of things from here. Yeah, the VR stuff. There's other examples as well. The one that we were using is the cubes, right? Same stuff, but in this example, it probably actually spins. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So ours doesn't spin, but uh, too bad. Yeah. Uh, what else? Yeah. So I think there's some examples here that allow you to use controllers to interact with the environment as well. So this these um web based, browser based uh, AR VR experiences, right? They not only work on the mobile phone, but they they actually more designed for um browsers within VR and AR headsets. So for example, the Oculus Quest, um, you will be able to open up maybe the Mozilla Firefox browser and then you access these websites and then you will be able to use your controllers in these environments as well. Yeah. So um, a lot of these browser-based examples, they also have the source code to control to manage the controllers. But I didn't include it in our version because most of us do not have the headsets and it's probably going to be confusing. Yeah, but there's just some context. Um, what else? What else? What else? What else? Um, there are other libraries that you can that you can use to also create um web based uh XR experiences like P five XR. Um, P five XR also has it's also seems pretty easy to use virtual reality, augmented reality stuff, right? Uh, some examples. Same VR image, VR example. Yeah. So they've got no example. Great. Yeah. Sorry, I'm not on my phone. Uh yeah, you can see the examples there. They've got code that they can that they have shared also that you can use to uh, upload your own content. And uh, I think it's pretty similar to what we saw just now. They also have a live editor and a preview. Uh just that they've got other kinds of um, libraries that are being used. So the code seems a lot cleaner here, right, than what we saw just now, um, but it's a bit different. So uh, they, they abstract away a lot of the low level concepts. Yeah. So this is something that you can look into P5XRJS. Um, more traditionally, which I think I might have put into the slides. So I, I might have put in the slides. Wait, hold on. Presentation. Where's my slides? Yeah, so other software um, would include um, Unity, Unreal Engine, Spark AR Studio, Fan Studio. So the lab I work in, right, in, in NUS um, actually uses Unity. Uh, and in Unity, we program in uh, C Sharp. And um, building AR VR experiences is is a. Uh, I'm I'm not sure whether "find" is the right word, but it's novel. <laughs> it's it's novel, and, and also, um, they are still relatively still relatively new, and and uh, people are still trying to find new use cases for it. Okay, and And there's a wide range of skill sets involved in designing an AR and VR system or game. So it's very similar to game design. Um, and a team would probably consist of um, a programmer um, and 3D artist to, to you know, create things that look better than cubes, right? And also maybe a UI UX designer to uh, to, to think about the interactions and what kind of um, experience you want to create for the end user. Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm not sure what's the background of, uh, what, what are your backgrounds? Uh, yeah, but I think there's really a variety of roles that, that you can play if you were to ever go into this field. 
And you know, in your next hackathon or next project, you can always try to incorporate some of these elements, especially since these are a lot of these are web based, right? So pretty easy to integrate into your project, uh, especially since you don't need to download them. Unity, Unreal Engine, Spark AR Studio. Okay, so Unreal Engine and Unity, these two, uh, they're typically used to build the application. Like for example, like a, it could be a mobile application or maybe a desktop application for VR and AR. Yeah. For Spark AR Studio is typically used to make uh Instagram and Facebook filters. Lens Studio is for Snapchat filters. Yeah, so there are a lot of different kinds of software that, that you can use. Um but for browser-based uh frameworks, it's still quite infant. And what you saw earlier is really quite um cutting edge in, in some sense, in that there's not many applications that uh use web-based. Uh, XR at this point, like that, that I know of, yeah, um, and more than this, uh, currently in the lab, I'm currently exploring how to use um, this web X XR technologies in conjunction with like, you know, some machine learning stuff, like, I think it's like pretty cool, you know, intersection of disciplines, yeah, and uh, that's about it for the workshop, yeah. Nito, yeah. Do you have any questions? Yeah, if any questions, any questions? We've we've got plenty of time to take questions actually. Oh. Any NUS mods in, in on AI VR? Yes, actually. So actually, right? Um, there's this um module. Well, it depends on what faculty you're from, but there's a module called CS four two four zero. Which is basically interaction design for augmented and virtual reality. Um, and let me go to NES mods so I can help them to plug some NES mod stuff. Mm. <laughs> Ilan will be proud. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so NES mods, AR, VR. I'm going to share with you some like, some four two four zero. Interaction design for virtual augmented reality. Yeah, so I, I'm sorry to the non NUS folks here. This might bore you a little. Yeah, but uh, we've got some modules that you know that deal with these kind of things. Yeah, so in this module, you will learn about um um all the technical concepts of designing a uh, experience, like how do you reduce motion sickness in users? Yeah. Uh, a fun example is actually it's quite interesting. You know, like for example. I think mean, one of the lessons they were sharing with us, like uh, a company that was developing a flying simulator, like flying, like flying right like, as a bird. Then like they realized that a lot of people like want to puke when they when they use the, the flying simulator because I mean we're not birds, right? So there's this dissonance between you sitting on a chair and your image, the, the imagery of you flying around, right? Yeah. So what helped was that they added a fake beak, a fake nose. <laughs> in the into the scene. So because they have this like stable frame of reference right in the scene, oh, interesting. then it reduced the amount of motion sickness. That kind of like of like VR hacks that you can they can, they can use to like alleviate motion sickness. So having that frame of reference was was uh useful to anchor the image as if you were in like a cockpit, you know, as opposed to like a bird. <laughs> yeah, so they kind of Things that are pretty cool, right? I mean, yeah. yeah. So, so they, you go into like some of the biology stuff, and like, oh, why, why is there like motion sickness constants? Um, if you're coming from like a FASS design background, um, you can do this module if you had taken like CS three two four zero, which just which is just interaction design, no focus on augmented reality and virtual reality. Um, but the the prerequisite for this would be the NM modules, the computational media literacy. So. This is not just for programmers, you know. I mean, I'm I'm showing you you guys that even uh designers can also take the CS four two four zero. So virtual reality, virtual reality, augmented reality is quite um accessible to to any anyone really, yeah, who has the interest. Yeah. Um, in the module, you also have to do a project to create a virtual reality and augmented reality experience. Um, for my year in my group, we created a a tai chi. <laughs> A tai chi similar tai chi experience for the elderly. The problem statement that we, we gave ourselves was how do we create a virtual reality experience for the elderly? <laughs> I I I don't have any videos to show y'all, 
Yeah, but it's quite funny. Yeah, yeah, it's it's like, also, whoa, I think there's some stuff called Mind Palace. There's also a story. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mind, Mind Palace, yeah. Mind Palace is, I think, they do like um, dementia. So they want to help dementia patients relive the memories of the past. Yeah, cool stuff, right? See, there are many use cases, you know. Yeah. Uh, I can't show you all the Tai Chi experience. I think you. <laughs> That's quite funny. Uh, what else? Yeah, um, do you have any other questions? Thanks for your question, Yuchen. Oh, please help us to fill out the, the Google form. Yeah, uh, please do. Please, please do. I need to, I need to, I need to screen that, that nonsense. <laughs> oh. How do I? Can, can I show you the screen? Yeah, can you see the link? Yeah, please do fill in the form. And also, like, do you have any questions? I mean, we have got a lot of time left. You know, can ask, ask, ask me some uh, hard questions. That will be hard. Yeah. And also, if you're looking for, like, you know, part-time job, you can always work in the lab. <laughs> you can work in the lab. Oh, I didn't know for. you were hiring. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, as in, like, I mean, we always need some, like, you know, we programmers. We have quite liking programmers. Yeah, so if you're interested, you know, you can always drop us an email or something. Oh, 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 oh. Oh. Hmm. You're so too big. Do you have any other questions? I think this, oh, this one, this. Yeah, I, I, I will take this question offline with Nicholas. Yeah. After the workshop, I think you can reach us. You can you can leave our telly handle so if they want to. Oh yeah, yeah. You can always reach us in and US hackers chat. Yeah. Uh, you can find me at Noah Pond. I don't know. I can't remember really. <laughs> yeah, you can find me here too. Yeah, we're all very free. <laughs> yes, we're very free. What what what's the handle? Uh, Noel Kwan, just N-O-E-L, take a few here. Let me check. Yes, correct. Yes. Okay. Yeah. If any other questions, otherwise we're going to close the workshop. Thanks for your participation. Yeah, thank you so much. Oh, oh, oh yeah, you know, if you are interested in like, a, you know, put into the feedback form like how we can improve and also maybe you want to try some of these things in person. What the, the, the chat. Oh, the chat lagging. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. Eh? Maybe it's just us. Uh. Yeah, so I guess leave us some comments then we can improve and also fix what needs to be fixed. If you find that I utter a lot of and remember a lot of nonsense. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yep. Okay, I think that concludes our workshop. Uh, thanks again, Francis, for taking the time to teach and share your knowledge. <laughs> yeah. Okay, see you all around. You don't know who's the chat person. What? I need to, I need to answer this guy. <laughs> But I cannot contact oh, yeah. him if I request this. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll just hang out here for for. What is it? Is it hung? The chat is hung. Is it? I think everybody can see. Oh. <laughs> I I cannot. Oh shit. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Nicholas. Uh, sorry, uh, Nicholas. I think you can PM uh Francis on Telegram. Yeah. Because I think the Zoom chat for Francis is not really working properly. Yeah, it's like hung. Yeah, he says your PMU. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Bye bye. Do, 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 do. Yeah, it's, it's, it's hung. <laughs> <laughs> At least it hung now. <laughs> <laughs> Gone.